Okay, next we're going to take a look about end-of-life issues and how Hospice of the Valley helps people deal with those end-of-life mm -hmm. issues, Talking, speaking about empathy. Absolutely. So stay with us. Our special edition of Your Health A to Z continues. Welcome back, everyone. One of the biggest challenges with health care is being a caregiver when someone you love is really ill. It's a traumatic experience for everyone. And the question is, what do you do when it becomes just too much to handle? Well, there is help out there, and it's free. It's called hospice. This is where Margaret Thrift has come to spend her final days. Surrounded by loved ones, comfort and peace become the focal point. Pastor Joyce Bukers guides the gathering. We're getting together for a gathering of loved ones for a special time of conversation and prayer knowing that the music and the prayer and the conversation brings us closer to that wonderful presence of love. So is there something special you'd like to say? To mama. You wanted to say mama, huh? Oh, that's She's one. ready to go see her mother and her baby kitties. She's ready to see her mama and baby kitties. This is just part of what Hospice of the Valley does for its patients. This renovated house in downtown Phoenix provides a home-like atmosphere. There's medical staff and volunteers to help families give their dying loved ones the best care possible at the end of life. For volunteer Sarah Grant, it's been a rich experience. The thing about end of life care is everyone has a life story that they want to tell someone. And they want someone to listen to their life story. And I get People say to me, oh, it must be so depressing to work there. And I say, absolutely not. I get so much more out of it than I put into it. I met Margaret in 1964. Frances has been Margaret's best friend and business partner for 40 years. And she was a, quite a partner. We'd go out and get listings, and she would had a, quite a sense of humor and loved, loved people, and they loved her. So when they called the home, instead of asking for their broker, they'd ask for Margaret, which was just super great. She had a bonding with people. Frances has now taken a break from business, put away her golf clubs, and is now by Margaret's side every day, learning how to do things such as therapeutic touch to ease Margaret's anxiety or trouble with breathing. It's a technique called the hand-heart connection. I've heard about hospice before, but I never really know what they were like. I knew that people would say they were good, you know, to uh, their patients and all, but this personal experience with them this time has been something else. They are real caretakers. You feel like you're at home here instead of being in an institution. It's a lot different. You feel peaceful knowing that Margaret's comfortable and, and, and they, they, they make her comfortable, you know, all the time that she's here. And, uh, it's just a, a good feeling to know that, that uh, she's in peace. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Wow, that is absolutely an amazing it place. Uh, join us now as Executive Director of Hospice of the Valley, Susan Levine, welcome, and Dr. Jill Hamilton, who is a geriatrician and also the medical director. Okay, let me ask you a question. I see people in the emergency department with these life-threatening illnesses who they, they've had for quite a while, and I, they get there and I say, what would, you like, what would you like me to do? Would you like me to do X, Y, and Z and prolong your life? And they look at me and go, I, I don't know. No one's ever said this to me before. So tell me about this new program you have. Healthcare Decisions is a project of Hospice of the Valley to help people write advanced directives and to help hospitals to follow them. And we're working with the Secretary of State's office to have a registry so that you and you and you and you and everybody will have a directive, know what they want, and be able to pull it up in the emergency and room. And they don't have to bring it because people, the last thing they do is grabbing a piece of paper and right. running with them to the emergency department. Well, that is, I, I can't wait for it to happen. That's terrific. Also, Susan, so many people, and we've uh, done many stories on, on Hospice of the Valley, but a lot of people really don't understand the concept still, the fact that it's free. What do you want to tell people out there when they need to give your organization a call? The, probably the, the biggest message we could do is say what you just said a you know, hundred times a day on, on national television. Call your local hospice. 
don't be afraid to, to make that first call. You know, it, it's a taboo that still exists in society that we don't want to use the death word, that we don't want to mention that somebody's dying, and how very sad. Because if we don't talk about it and we don't address it and we don't seek help, then, then you know, the, the aloneness and the isolation and the overwhelm of the family can, can leave lasting marks. And that's so important, the point you bring up about the burden of the family. And this is really a, a relief for everyone to enjoy those final days. We saw that with Margaret. It was great. We've been doing lots and lots of education of physicians, John, and, and still, right. you know, people don't know what hospice is. Yeah. So the kind of promotion that we hope, you know, will come from, from exposure like this and from healthcare decisions um, we're hoping that people will come out of the closet, so to speak. You know, death is not a four-letter word, and terminal illness is not a bad thing. It just is. And we find that when our patients come to us, they sometimes do so much better because they're now switching into a very palliative and comforted mm -hmm. atmosphere, and mostly in their own homes, not mostly in, right. in an institutional setting like the beautiful Coronado home. But they are then getting the kind of care that, that helps them feel better longer. All right. Susan Levine, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you both ladies for joining us. Uh, we sure appreciate it. Okay, coming up on Your Health uh, A to Z, there's a few things that you can do to change the look about yourself for under $1,000. And we're going to look at them all. Welcome back, everyone, to Your Health A to Z. I'm Heidi Fogelsong. We've got Dr. John Schufeld in the other part of our house today. We've been so serious about some of the health issues, important information to know. It's time to get a little shallow. Yes, let's talk about looking more beautiful for under $1,000. And I'm going to ask a few of our audience members, you are such a beautiful woman, but what would you have done under 1000 bucks if you could? Um, I would probably have a facial and an overhaul. An overhaul. Oh, I like that. How about you, ma'am? What would you want done? Laser hair removal. Laser. Oh, well, you have come to the right place. Yes, you have. And, and ma'am, gorgeous woman here, what would you have done? <sighs> oh, I'd like about 10 years off. <laughs> 10 years off. You know what? I think we'll work on that. We'll see what we can do. Well, actually, believe it or not, hair removal is a very, uh, very hot trend right now, and it's evolved. Technology has helped with that. Dr. John Schufeld is over in our kitchen area with the scoop on that. Hey, John. Well, I don't want. I hope. No, I hope this is off camera and nobody sees this. But you know, I actually had. I used to look like Fred Flintstone around noon, and I went and got. Um, I, oh my gosh! I could spend 20 minutes shaving. I thought, by all the time I spend shaving, there's got to be a better alternative. And I actually met Dave Bratton Barnes with Desert Cosmetic Center, who now actually don't shave thanks to Dave. So, Dave, how, how does this work, and what are you going to be doing here our, to our fine model, to our fine young model? Well, actually, I did bring the machine today to do photo facial, but I want to demonstrate it on the body. A lot of women think of it as photo facial just for the face. We can treat age spots all over the body, which is a, a big issue here in Arizona for all the photo damage. Now, the, but, la I'm sorry, the laser actually really kind of hurt me. This actually, the, your machine didn't really hurt anywhere near like that. What can you do if somebody's really squeamish and doesn't want, you know, they want to feel a thing? Well, we have a couple things we can do. We brought the Amla cream, which is a topical numbing agent. So we can put that on about 20 minutes prior. So if we're doing your face, we're doing someone's face, her legs, whatever, if they're particularly sensitive, put it on about 20 minutes early and they go ahead and zap, and they just don't feel it quite as much. And we also have a piece of equipment that blows extremely cold air. Okay. Well, let's give it a shot. You ready to go? No. Okay. No, no, this is photofacial. This won't be hair removal on her chest, so. That, that, that would just be me. Yeah. Guys, I hate that to that quite interrupt, but, but how are you doing? And what is your name? Kelly Ray. Kelly, you're on TV, and we're going to do something to your chest. But day's great. You're in the best of care. Well, right. I'm going to start with her hand. This is a, a big issue for a lot of women, men too. You know, when we're driving, we get probably some of the most sun damage just driving, that, the that hood of the car, so the true. windshield. All right. So we can treat some of the age spots right on there. Just that easy. Wow. And how does that feel? I don't feel anything, actually. Okay. So you're saying you get rid of all those spots from the sun damage in your chest, the hand area? That yeah, the fabulous. arms, the chest. And I know I have a couple girlfriends myself, actually, that won't wear the V-neck shirts because they don't want to expose that sun damage. They feel it makes them look mm -hmm. older. So what so happens when you do it? For example, if you do a chest, what was going to happen? I Oh, put your goggles on. I These know. are your Arnold Schwarzenegger goggles. Do not mess with Dave <laughs> when she has her glasses on. Because she'll mess you up. Yes, mess she will. Up. <laughs> Okay. Let's call me governor. Okay, so 
I don't oh. necessarily go for one spot. I can treat the entire chest and any uneven pigmentation. Some of it will come up to the surface, flake off within a couple days, some in a couple weeks.